chapter number six. We're we're going to finish up this section of of the scripture tonight. I I think we've covered it pretty well, um, but there's a few more things. And as I was telling somebody earlier, uh, you can keep mining things out, and it just seems like it's a never-ending mine. And but we don't want to, you know, beat it to death. But on the same token, we want to make sure we give it a good read and and a study. So uh, we'll move on from it tonight. But uh, we we're only been through the first eight verses of Genesis chapter number six. So. Uh, and tonight we'll look at a few more things. Last Wednesday we were looking at the subjects of the giants and also the sons of God. Uh, we left off uh, last week with the subject matter of strange flesh. And, and before we get to that though, I want to mention again what I said last week just as a way of reminder that much of the fame of Lucifer is the result of mythology and uh, I said to you last week, the book of Enoch, and you know we're not going to go down that trail tonight, but the Bible gives us only a few details about him by name, by the name Lucifer, but several other uh, supposed facts have also found their way into the hearts and minds of a lot of Christians that are just not biblical. Uh, like I told you last week, he was we've always heard him said that he was the third of the archangels and he was the highest of them all and blah, 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 but... Nowhere does the Bible say that, and I told you last week that that uh, Michael is the only only angel called an archangel in the Bible, and so uh, the only other Bible text which uh, we have to contribute to Lucifer is Ezekiel 28, and we're going to look a little bit at that tonight. So let's go over to Ezekiel 28 and look at a few things with regard to. Uh, the devil and Lucifer at the time that this takes place. It's talking about Lucifer here, I believe, in Ezekiel 28. If you find your place in Ezekiel 28, I'm going to begin reading in verse 11 of that chapter. And by the way, just so you know, um, if, if you don't pick up on it tonight, I'm going to cover some of this on Sunday morning in my Sunday morning message because I'm going to be preaching on Sunday morning about Satan. We talked about the Lord last week, and I thought this week it would be a good, appropriate thing to talk about Satan um, and what the Bible says about him. But Ezekiel 28, verse 11, the Bible says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. And by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up. Because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. And so from these verses, we can discern that Ezekiel is speaking here about Lucifer, and, and uh, we know him as Satan. And we can also see his downward progression from a place of prominence when he was created by God, and even reading that he was beautifully arrayed in covering of precious gems, However, despite that, his final resting place in God's universe will be the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. So that kind of gives you a little bit more about Lucifer, but he's only mentioned, as I said last week, in that one verse. And um, everything else is in reference to him, but 
doesn't call him by the name Lucifer. So let's get back tonight to what we were talking about last week when we left off, uh, the term strange flesh. The, the word strange, the word strange flesh is, is mentioned only one time in the, in the scriptures, and that is in Jude chapter 1 and verse 7. <clears throat> and I told you last week that this terminology, strange flesh, is used and applied when two individuals attempt to create or procreate, I should say, when they're not the same flesh. Uh, this makes an attempt at procreation incompatible, and the results can be devastating, as we'll see uh, tonight as we study. But God condemns such practice in the Bible in several places for the reason that it never turns out good. And God's, uh, excuse me, God calls such a practice sin. Regardless of what the sin is, Sin never turns out well. And we need to ingrain that into our head because there are times when we think that we can outthink God, we can outthink God and His Word, and we can make statements about sinful things that we do and say things like, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have done it, but it all turned out okay. That is never to be our goal. That is never to be... Uh, uh, words coming out of our mouth. Sometimes when sin finds its way into a believer's life, the devil tries to convince you that even though it is a sin, it will still turn out okay and there's still benefit in it. But nowhere does the Bible say that or give any hope in that regard. So how does, Genesis, how does it relate to Genesis 6? As we saw the angels that left their first estate, we talked about this last week, procreated with the daughters of men. And uh, we, we dispelled the rumor or the, the, the theology that the, uh, the daughters of men uh, were, uh, or the sons of God were from the godly line of Seth, and the daughters of men were uh, those that were ungodly. That's not what the Bible is teaching at all. And, and so uh, we know last week, we talked about it, that they procreated with the daughters of men. The angels that had left their first estate were in the earth, and they tried to and attempted to and were sex successful at procreating with the daughters of men. Angels and humans. That is strange flesh. It's, they're not compatible. And so it earned them a special place, chained in darkness. Now, we also said last week, it didn't say all of the angels. It said the angels, which means some of them. doesn't mean all of them, and we'll talk more about that. But in Jude chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we read these verses last week. It says, the angels which kept not their first estate. So, we don't know exactly how many there were, but it says the angels which kept not their first estate. But left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an, exa or an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So in verse 6 we see the difference, or excuse me, we see the reference to the great white throne judgment. Jude calls it the judgment of the great day. But he's talking there about the great white throne judgment. God will never just forget about sin. See, we think sometimes because we don't have any direct repercussion for our sinfulness, that God somehow is going to let it go and it's going to pass and all that. God will never forget about sin. It must always be paid for. In Jude chapter 1, verse 7, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh. So we see that the, the sin here, uh, we see that the, the sin was a sexual sin, which plays right into the understanding of the daughters of men uh, being uh, procreated with the sons of God, the angels. And we also told you last week that Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 seemed to indicate that Satan has seed of his own. Remember we talked about that last week. He, he made reference to, uh, God made reference to the fact that Satan had seed and, 
And uh, the seed that was in the woman, Mary, was from the Lord. It was the Holy Ghost. But it also tells us that Satan, as with all of the angels, has the ability to procreate. This seems far removed from what many of us have always understood about angels. It doesn't fit the narrative that the world talks about. But it is the Word of God. And so we have a choice. We can either believe what the world talks about with regard to angels, or we can believe what the Bible says. I choose to believe the Bible. Uh, they're not the TV angels that you see portrayed in all the shows. Uh, the Touched by an Angel show that was on years ago and how they all started glowing whenever there was something spiritual going to happen. And it's ridiculous. Uh, first of all, they were always women. Well, I think there was one guy on there. But, uh, and everywhere in the Bible we find angels, they're in the masculine gender. Uh, they're hymns. And by the way, Charlie didn't really employ three of them. <laughs> Just a little humor. So it makes good biblical sense that all of the angels were capable of going after strange flesh. But not all of them did. I told you last week, every one of us has a choice that we, we can make. We can either follow God and do God's will, and, or we can go against God and go against His will. And apparently some of the angels did, some of the angels didn't. And we believe they did exactly that. They procreated, which in turn brought the flood down upon all mankind in Noah's day. I believe after studying this for the last several weeks, that that is exactly why God flooded the world. Because He, he was basically trying to rid the, the, the pollution of the race that had occurred. God took action. God was willing to destroy all but Noah's family to cleanse the earth from this contaminated race of beings that had sprung up. They're called giants. And so we have to calculate what impact that that played in the history of mankind throughout the ages. Could it be that the coming Antichrist could come from the seed of Satan? I think there's some evidence in the Bible that might suggest that. Maybe he will be one of these giants. Remember I told you a couple of weeks ago that giants were before the flood and there will be giants after the flood. We see Goliath. He came after. So somehow, all of the, the giants in the human race that was wiped out, or the polluted race, uh, the compromised race, whatever you want to call it, was wiped out in the flood, but yet, the, lo and behold, here's Goliath. Where did he come from? So let's see what the Bible says. Maybe he will be one of these giants that will make up the Antichrist, maybe one of these giants that will make up the earthly kingdom of the last days that we mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago from Daniel chapter 2. But let's see what the Bible says. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4. Notice how it begins. Let no man deceive you by any means. Can I say to you right there? That's Satan's playbook. Deception. Making you believe something that isn't true. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is as God sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That is a reference to the Antichrist. It is a reference to the Antichrist during the tribulation period. That is what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 is talking about. It would seem odd that if the Antichrist is nothing more than a mortal man, if he was somebody that just comes out of society like we've always wondered and thought about, it seems odd that the Bible would use the terminology calling him the son of perdition. More importantly, that he would have the power to pull off what the Bible says about those last days. 
The phrase son of perdition is used in only two places in our Bible. The first place is in John chapter 17, verse 12, that says, while I was with them in the world, now this is Jesus talking, he said, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in, my, in, in thy name, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, in John 17, he's not talking about the Antichrist anymore. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. The John 17, 2 verse is a reference to Judas, not the Antichrist. And the other use of that phrase, the, the uh, son of perdition, is the one that I just read to you from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. That is a reference to the Antichrist. So here we have two people... We have the Antichrist and we have Judas called the son of perdition. We know that Christ will one, one day, once and for all, he is going to crush all opposition to his authority. We saw that in the book of Revelation study. He'll do it in a matter of an hour. But when that future event occurs, the timing of which will be at the end of the seven years of tribulation, just prior to Christ's second coming, or act, actually at this kind of simultaneous, Christ will establish his earthly kingdom for 1,000 years. Satan will be bound and thrown into the pit with the other chained angels. And after 1,000 years, he will be loosed for what the Bible calls a little season. That's Revelation chapter 20, verse 3. So what does all of that have to do with Genesis chapter 6? And the sons of God and the giants that were inhabiting the earth at the time of Noah. In the second Thessalonians passage, chapter 2, verse 3 that we just read, the Antichrist is called the son of perdition. Therefore, he is the son of Satan. The word perdition carries the meaning of destruction, misery, ruin, and perishing. We know that that is Satan's playbook against all things Christ-like. Uh, Satan desires to destroy, to ruin all things Christian. Uh, could it be that Judas Iscariot was also from the seed of Satan? John chapter 6, verse 71 says this, he spake, and Jesus says, He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So we know he's talking about Judas. But interestingly, in one verse before that verse, in verse 70, we see the following. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Interesting. These are two interesting verses concerning Judas Iscariot. In Luke chapter 22, verse 3, the Bible says, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being, the number of, the, being of the number of the twelve. And then in John 13, verse 27, it says, And after the, the uh, sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Interestingly, the word entered in those verses comes from a root word which means entrance into any condition or entrance into the state of a condition or the state of things. It would be like a person who quickly comes into a, a state of rage from his current circumstances. You know, you're here one minute, something happens and you just go into a rage. The only two things we know conclusively from the Bible about Judas Iscariot is what I just read to you. And it's also is that he is one of the original 12 apostles and that Judas betrayed Jesus for the 30 pieces of silver. The only other references to him are what I just gave you when Jesus himself calls him a devil. After that, we only know he, he committed suicide we have no clear genealogy of Judas anywhere in the Bible. Many of the men in the Bible that we see referenced, we can trace their roots, so to speak. Can't be done with Judas. 
No clear mention of him in his early life. His name just appears in the scriptures without any foundational information. Which kind of lends itself to maybe, just maybe, he's of the seed of Satan. The Bible called him the son of Simon in one verse. However, we have no information of which Simon. The Bible calls Judas Iscariot the son of perdition, which means he was the devil's child. Now, so let's talk about the giants. I think we've covered the sons of God pretty well, but let's talk about the giants for a moment. The giants who were said to be in the earth prior to the flood of Noah's day. What we do know about them is, is a few things. Obviously, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, says there were giants in the earth in those days. And we're talking about those days of Noah. And also after that, when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men and they bare uh, children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So from one verse of scripture, here's what we know about the giants. There was more than one. Genesis 6, 4 says giants, plural. These giants were in the earth at the time of Noah's day. We know that. These giants also were in the earth after the flood of Noah. Genesis 6, 4 uses the phrase, and also after that. So we know they were before, and we know they were after. We have an example of Goliath by name in the Bible that was a giant. Number four, we know the angels procreated with the daughters of mortal man. The result, we believe, was these giants were produced. Notice in verse number four of Genesis 6, it says they bear children to them. Now what's really interesting, remember we've talked about that everywhere in the Bible that we see an angel reference, it's always in the hymn, male gender. If these were something other than angels that were being procreated, and becoming giants, why don't we see any female giants? No mention of any offspring of the angels procreating with the daughters of men and producing anything but the male species. The offspring of this unequal union was the offspring of that union, I believe, and they became mighty men, the verse 4 says, which were of old men of renown. And by the way, the word renown means fame and reputation. You can imagine, think about it with me for a second. If we had some nine foot guy walking around Winooski, he'd have a reputation, right? Those that would see him wouldn't believe it. Uh, those that would see him out and about walking around the streets would probably be scared to death. They say, who is this guy? But in our text, we see that there was many men like that. Not just a few, but there was many. And when Moses sent the spies into the promised land, he, they sent in 12, and 10 of them came back scared to death. So let's look at that text with us. Uh, look, look, look at this with me for tonight. The Numbers chapter 13. Look at the Numbers 13 text with me. Numbers 13. We'll read a couple of verses here. So we're already past the flood of Noah when we come to Numbers 13. The flood has come and gone. The earth is being repopulated. And in Numbers 13, verse 26, the Bible says, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron, and to all the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. Now let me just stop right there for a second. That was God's promise. So, what do, what do we see here? God's promises can be believed. They're true. And so, and, it says, and this is the fruit of it. So they brought back 
a big bunch of grapes and pomegranates and, you know, they're carrying them on a stave between two men. I mean, these were big grapes. And says, this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. So we know from other accounts of this event that this, what we just read, was the spies have come back, the 12 spies have come back, and they're giving their report of what they saw, what they found in the promised land. And when they returned, we just read in Numbers 13 what they saw. Caleb is the one doing the talking here. And it's Caleb and Joshua's perspective that we hear in, or that we read in Numbers 13. The other 10 spies that went with them, they were not so optimistic. As a matter of fact, they were afraid because of what they saw. We can conclude it was not the grapes and the pomegranates. In other words, they didn't say, oh, look at the grapes, look at that. Boy, that scares me. No, it wasn't that. That wasn't what was frightening them. It was most likely what we read in Numbers 13, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And then in verse 33, it says this. That fear is validated here. And there, were, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. These guys were big guys. Huge guys. And the spies of Israel went in there and they felt like grasshoppers compared to these guys. The name Anak is a reference to the giants who were living in Canaan at that time. The giants that are mentioned in verse 33 that we just read confirms that the flood of, after the flood of Noah's day, when God destroyed everything, every living creature from the face of the earth, that somehow there was a return of the giants in Moses' day. And in that verse 33, the word giants comes from a root word which means feller or bully or tyrant. Hey, if there's a nine foot guy in the crowd, he's probably going to have his way. Yeah. Amen? Now we know from the story of Goliath that he was a large man who pretty much did what he pleased. And that's pretty much what he was doing. He had the whole Israelite army on the run. They were scared to death of this man Goliath. There wasn't one person in that whole army that wanted to take him on. Except David. Now, we don't know a lot about David, but we do, we do know this. He was a courageous guy. He was a guy who believed God at his promises. And he believed that God could see him through. And when all the other people were cowering in the shadows, afraid of Goliath, David said, no, I'll, I'll go out there. I'll take him on. And we know the story. He did exactly that. So the question is this. How did these giants get on this side of the flood after God supposedly wiped out all the living flesh except Noah and his family? Well, there's only two possible answers. The first one is this. Someone in Noah's family who entered the ark had procreated with angels prior to the flood. And after they left the ark and began to replenish the earth, the bloodline was again, again reintroduced. And the problem with that theory, though, is we have no biblical evidence for any of those facts. It's plausible, but I guess if we want to believe the Bible, we can't believe that because there is no evidence of it in the Scripture. The second way that it could happen is this. It's, I think, a much more biblical and logical explanation is Satan and his angels began again to procreate with the daughters of men. We have biblical evidence for this theory. 
It seems logical to believe that after the flood, there was once again a contamination of the race as it was before. Remember I told you in the beginning that Satan wants to do anything he can do to destroy and confuse and deceive everything Christian. In Numbers, the children of Anak were associated with the land of Canaan. Could this be the reason why God told the Israelites upon entering the promised land? They were to destroy all of the Canaanites. You know, I've often wondered about that. Maybe you have too. But you have the Israelites going into a place. God calls it the promised land. And God tells them, when you get in there, I want you to destroy all the people. I want you to destroy the men, the women, the little boys, the little girls, the animals. Destroy it all. So ask yourself the question, why would God do that? Could it be that again the race was contaminated? By the angels who had left their first estate and then others began to follow as well. And Satan was the orchestrator of it all. Could this be the reason why the Israelites told, were told to wipe everything out, destroy all, the, all of the Canaanites? We know the truth. They didn't do it. God said to do it, but they didn't do it. Isn't that just like us? God says, this is what I want. And we say, okay. God says, I need ten. And we say, oh, yeah, I'll give you nine and three quarters. But i got to hold back a little bit for me. See, that's oftentimes the way we are, folks. We don't like to admit it, but it's the truth. Could it be that he might once again blot out all existence of this perverted, strange flesh? Seems logical taking all the reference tied together in the Word of God. Folks, this is Bible evidence that I'm telling you tonight. It was what the Bible says. I'm not telling you something that a commentator has told me. I'm just patching together and piecing together Scripture upon Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. And by the way, that's how we're supposed to do it. The statement that the sin of the fallen angels was that they left their first estate to descend to the earth for the purpose of going after strange flesh, ought to forever settle the characterization of that sin. But when you read those words, what else could it be? When you patch together the verse here and the verse here, and you tie the words and the words here and the words there, it should settle it for us. No need to argue about it anymore. Which in turn gives us the answer as to why these giants were there before Noah and how they will once again be originated during the tribulation period. Remember I said to you a couple weeks ago that during the tribulation period, it's going to be, well, let's look at it. Go to Daniel chapter 2. It was a couple of weeks ago that we read it, so let's refresh our memory and see what the Bible had to say. Daniel chapter 2. It's very clear. Daniel chapter 2, and look with me at, let's see, verse 41. It says in verse 41, Daniel 2.41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of a potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. So there's a reference sort of in, in, in typology about strange flesh. And verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas, verse 43, Thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, that here it is, they, remember that? 
shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. The angels don't procreate amongst themselves. They procreate with humans. And in the days of the king shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. There's the millennial kingdom. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So regardless of whether these giants are brought back to prominence and ruling the world of the end days of the tribulation period, here's the best news. doesn't matter. Because Christ is going to destroy them again once and for all. Gives us the answer to who these giants were. And how they will once again originate. But they will be finally destroyed for all time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns at His second coming and puts down all opposition to His authority, all opposition to His rule. And just say this, it won't be like now. See, now we have all kinds of ungodliness in our world. We have ungodly kingdoms, ungodly rulers. We have violence. All those things will be once and for all put to rest when Christ rules from Jerusalem on His throne during the 1,000 year millennial reign of Christ. And so we'll leave it there for tonight. Hopefully this will put to rest the giants and the sons of God until we meet them again. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You once again for another opportunity we've had tonight. Lord, we know that uh, much of your word is easily confounding us. But Father, we know that if we'll just do our work and study, read, compare, run Scripture with Scripture, we can come to the understanding that you want us to have. And so Father, our prayer tonight is that you'll help us as a church, as individuals, to be ever studying your word, Lord until you come for us. What a glorious day that will be. It's the blessed hope, and we're thankful for it. Lord, have your way in our hearts now, and give us safety as we travel home, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.